Hello there, today we'll look at Excite Cross Covariance Image Transformers by Facebook AI, INRIA and Sorbonne University. So in this paper, the authors propose a kind of a transpose of an attention mechanism. So instead of the attention working across tokens and uh, tokens attending to other tokens, now the, it is the features or the channels attending to other channels and in a matter across the entire sequence that you input. This means there is no longer a quadratic complexity in the length of the input sequence. And this supposedly works particularly well for image data. So these are akin to the vision transformers that work on patches in patched images, and they reach comparable good performance on things like ImageNet classification, self supervised learning, but also dense prediction like uh, segmentation and so on. So we're going to look into this paper, it is, it is kind of weird to how to think about this. Um, so the idea is pretty simple, but I think it, it's kind of weird. And it the question is to me a little bit, uh, can this still be called a transformer in the way that it operates? Because as it seems to me after reading the paper, and I think they also mentioned this during the paper, it is more like a, a convnet, honestly, uh, that just kind of um, has one dynamic part in it. So one of the convolutions is a dynamic convolutions, but we'll see. And, uh, you know, this could be a good architecture for future image for future image processing. So here they say, let me grab my yellow. Um, following tremendous success in NLP transformers have recently shown much promise for computer vision. Okay, so the self attention operation underlying transformers yields global interactions between all tokens, i.e. words or image patches, and enables flexible modeling of image data beyond the local interactions of convolutions. This flexibility comes with a quadratic complexity in time and memory, hindering application to long sequences and high resolution images. So this is the, the problem transformers, good attention mechanism, powerful, however, there is a quadratic complexity in time and memory in terms of the sequence length. And that's why we can't apply it to long sequences or high resolution images. They say we propose a transposed version of self attention that operates across feature channels rather than tokens, okay, where the interactions are based on the cross covariance matrix between keys and queries. Uh, the resulting cross covariance attention has linear complexity in the number of tokens allows efficient processing of high resolution images, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so and then they propose a an entire architecture built upon the XCA the cross covariance attention, which they call excite. So that's the cross covariance image transformer. It says it combines the accuracy of conventional transformers with the sealability of convolutional architectures, sorry, scalability. <laughs> we validate the effectiveness by reporting excellent results on multiple benchmarks, including self supervised image classification on ImageNet, object detection, instance segmentation, yada, 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 they're super good. Okay. So what is this new kind of attention? This is the main graphic in the paper. And on the left, you can see how the whole attention looks. So this would be the whole model is consistent of these excite layers. So you'd have sort of input tokens down here. And then you have L of these excite blocks. And at the end, you'd have whatever a classification layer, or a segmentation layer or something like this. But in in, the, in our case, this here, is what would be a self attention, but followed by a feed forward network. And you can see that the cell, it's essentially the same, the feed forward network is still here. But the self attention block has been replaced by these two blocks. And the bottom one is this cross covariance attention, which does attention pretty much like you're used to, there's a there's a tiny difference, I said the idea here is pretty simple. Uh, in the 
in the mathematical way. It's just a bit weird to think about it. So on the top, you have the classic self attention that is used throughout transformers currently. And on the bottom, you have this new proposed cross covariance attention. And you might notice that the only thing that is different if you look at the at the pictures is that the green and the orange matrix here are skipped. So for that, we dive a little bit into what attention does regular usually. So I think I've drawn this picture about a 1000 times, but um, forgive me if I do it one more time. Okay, so um, every we have, let's say we have a series of tokens like this one here. And this can be word word embeddings in language, but this can be image patches in images. So the way vision transformers work is it's prohibitively large to process each pixel individually. So what they do is they take the image and they put it into patches. And now each patch becomes sort of one of these tokens. Okay. Uh, as opposed to convolutional networks, which can actually work on these high resolutions uh, directly by applying only the local convolution operation. So these are sequence elements of whatever form and every of the, one of these sequence elements exposes a query vector. So the query vector is a vector that's supposed to tell uh, sort of what it wants to know about the other sequence elements. And then also each one exposes a key vector. So the key vector tells a little bit like what's contained in the in this uh, token. So the way this is routed is that the query each query is compared to each key. And then the information is routed according to which ones have the largest inner product. For example, the next representation of this token right here, uh, we, we need to look at its at its query, and we need to compare it to all the keys that we find. So in this case, only this key right here matches. So we would expect that um, a lot of so the connection between those two is very strong. Ultimately, what you're going to do in here, in here, you're going to build up a fully connected layer, right? Everything's connected to everything with different strengths. But the strength of the connection is dynamic, the strength of the connection is determined by the uh, by the attention mechanism rather than fully learned. Okay. So, uh, so an MLP would be a fully learned connection matrix, which is fixed. However, an attention matrix is a dynamic connection matrix. In this case, in the cross covariance attention, we do something very similar, but we have to think a bit differently. So now here, what we have is essentially we have vectors. Let's represent these token things as uh, vectors. And uh -huh. let's have three, no, we have five data points. And they all have four dimensions, we'll leave away query and key and so on right now. So what what you do is you don't watch the tokens as a sequence. However, you watch the channels as the sequence. So this here is now one element. This is one element, this is one element, and this is one element. So you'd have to somehow trans can I rotate this? I cannot. Yeah, I cannot rotate it. You just <laughs> imagine in your mind this rotated now each channel exposes a query. And then each channel exposes a key. And now the information is routed not between uh, sequences of not between from token to token, but from channel to channel. So essentially, you look across the entire uh, sequence in the first channel, and you decide, okay, what kind of information is in this first feature across the entire sequence. And you can see kind of how that makes sense. So with the self attention, you can see that, you know, a token in a, um, in a picture, it might be an eye, so a patch, a patch might contain a part of an eye, right? And then another patch might contain a part of a mouth right here. Okay, there's a tooth. And uh, it, it would be important if these two things could communicate with each other, because that would give a hint that there might be a face in the image. 
in this framing, um, we look across we look across all of the things, right? And maybe the first channel is responsible for recognizing eye-like structures anywhere in the image, right? Across all the patches. So this could be like the channel that is kind of like, I think there's an eye somewhere. And then this here could be the channel that says, I think there is like a mouth uh, somewhere in the image. And you can also see it's valuable if those two things communicate, it comes away from this localization aspect, and more towards communicating across the entire sequence, what kind of features there are. Now, it's not directly the channels that expose this, of course. So if you think, uh, it's also not, you know, directly the tokens that are compared here. Um, so if you think of your data matrix x as a big matrix, and this big matrix has is n by d somehow, uh, not somehow, but exactly. So you have n data points, and every data point has an embedding of size d, maybe d is four here. So we have n vectors, each has four entries, what you would do in the self attention is you would transpose this like so. And what you would obtain would be a matrix of size d by d. Okay. Um, but not until in between, you multiplied with, sorry, you multiplied with the keys and the value matrices. So the way the self attention formula works is that you first multiply x by a, um, they have the formula somewhere here on the comparison. So what you do is if this is x, you multiply this by a matrix that is learned, that gives you the queries, and then you multiply x also uh, with the you multiply x with the matrix that is supposed to give you the keys, and then you transpose this. And then that is your self attention. So it becomes something like x w q w k transposed x transposed. So you can see the how the information flows is modulated by these learned parameters here. And that gives you the self attention matrix. So essentially, you will have a transformation matrix right here. Let's say that's d by d for simplicity. And that is you don't want to compare the tokens directly, but you want to compare sort of a function of the tokens. So we have that then you have the uh, key weight matrix, which is also d by d. And then you have this thing right here. So you can see that gives you an n by n matrix, ultimately, which tells you how much every single data point is connected or attending to how or to which other data point. Okay, so this is this routing table we saw up here, ultimately, this matrix right here is this matrix right here. And that's how it comes to be. So what do you do with this matrix famously, right, you take this, you do the soft max of your x w w x like this, and you multiply it by the so called values and the values are nothing else than again, you multiply some sort of weight matrix um, you multiply some sort of weight matrix with your data. So do I have this correctly right here? Um, yeah, I guess. So you have this, and you multiply this, is, you have the soft max of this, you multiply your, again, your data matrix by some sort of other function. But essentially, this here are the values, and you decide how to mix the values of each of the tokens to get the next tokens. So from the point of view of one token, in the output layer, you decide how should I aggregate across the values of the input layer. That's what the attention gives you. Now, if we look at cross attention, uh, sorry, if you knew all this, but it's now we contrast this with cross attention. 
So what we do in cross attention is we again have our data matrix like so. But what we do is we again, we multiply um, by queries and keys by these matrices. But now we do it differently. We do it. So first, now I've uh, I need to replace this up here. So why is it green? Orange? Wow, I didn't know you could do that. This is freaky. All right, I'm done now. Thanks. So we again multiply this here. But we multiply by the other thing from the left, like this. So it's the same data, the same matrices, but now they are multiplied in a different order, which means that as you can see right here, this is no longer the matrix of inner products being computed here. This is in fact, I guess the matrix of outer products. And Coincidentally, the matrix of outer products is probably smaller than the matrix of inner products, because uh, the dimensionality here, um, D is smaller, I have made. Yes, okay. So you can see here, this is D by D. This is D by N, this is N by D. And then this is D by D. So the resulting matrix is going to be a D by D matrix, not an N by N matrix, which means that right here, we aggregate across the sequence. Okay, so the information of where things are is in the sequence gets lost. Um, and is aggregated across. Um, and this here directly, this here is the if this were centered, it's the covariance matrix, but I think they call it the cross covariance matrix or yeah, because it's not centered, but essentially, it is the covariance matrix um, of the mini batch you have right here, not of the mini batch, sorry. It's the covariance matrix across the tokens in a single data point. So this matrix here essentially tells you how you need to aggregate the channels for in order to go to the next layer. So this again is multiplied by the uh, values. And as we said before, the values are just a linear function. But again, here, this is now multiplied from ah, this is now multiplied from the left and not from the right. So again, we have our data right here. And we have our this by the way, I didn't label it before this is V W. Sorry, W V another learned function that gives you the values. Okay, so this here are the values. And this here tells you how you how one channel attends to the other. So every token here goes through this process independently. Okay. So for every token, it's essentially every token by itself goes now through this process of aggregating features uh, from the other channels in the token. So very much this is like a one by one convolution, okay, with uh, this here being the convolutional kernel. So usually, I guess the convolutional kernel is represented differently, because you also want to represent it in in space. But essentially, um, this tells you how you aggregate information across channels in this one single token. So every single token goes through this map. Um, that is, first of all, the learned map, but then the dynamically constructed map. So this is very much a dynamic one by one convolution, where the convolutional kernel is dependent on the entire sequence. Okay, but there is no information mixing, there is no information uh, sharing across tokens anywhere here, except implicitly, because of course, the weights in this kernel are dependent on the entire sequence up here, but not explicitly. So once we have the kernel, once we have the how we aggregate across the channels, every token only ag aggregates across its own channels. Okay, so the, the information doesn't get spread across the 
across the image or whatnot across the sequence, like in the self attention. And that is that's why I'm saying I'm not even sure this is a transformer, because so far, it's just a dynamic one by one convolution. The second layer, sorry, the, the third layer here is a feed forward network. And this is exactly the same as this right here. So the except in the feed forward network, again, every token goes by itself and reconfigures itself according to some uh, channel mutation according to some one by one convolution. However, uh, the feed forward network is a learned, uh, con a learned transformation and not a dynamic one. So the XCA transformation is a dynamically, so it's learned, but the dynamic production is learned. And the feed forward network is just learned directly with a direct weight matrix. So essentially, these are two feed forward layers here, except one is dynamic. And then the only other thing they have here is this local patch interaction. And what is this? This is essentially a convolution, it, not essentially, it is exactly a convolution. So if you um, think of this of this sequence of tokens, the first step is we aggregate across all the tokens, right, then we come up with a transformation, and then every token goes through this transformation by itself. Okay. So that's the that's the first layer we just discussed. Then there is a convolution. And the convolution is just a yeah, a local patch interaction, they call it, but it's essentially a convolution. So it's a convolutional kernel that slides across the sequence. And um, yeah, gives you sort of the next sequence. So for example, this token right here, it, it will be able, so its convolutional kernel reaches this, this and this one. Okay, and this is not an attention mechanism. This is just a classic convolutional kernel. And it is even depth separated. So this goes only within the same feature channel. So if you think again of our data matrix here, with the feature channels, um, the convolutional kernel would be something like aggregating over this and just you just slide it everywhere, you slide it. So it's depth wise, um, separable, and you slide it across the image right here. So the, the good thing here is that this gives you the interaction between tokens, even if only local, but it doesn't add a lot to the parameters, because if it's depth wise separable, right, um, it's very few parameters, and actually also very few. Uh, it, there's not much compute and memory overhead. But again, this is a convolution. So the first step is a convolution. The second step is a convolution, and like an explicit convolution. And the third step, the feed forward one, again, is kind of like a convolution. So there, you have a box much like here, except you don't come up with the box dynamically, you simply learn the box, and then every token goes by itself through the box. Okay, independent of all the other tokens. And that's how you get the next layer. So this is it. It's a dynamic convolution followed by a real convolution followed by a so it's a dynamic one by one convolution followed by a real depth wise separable, but not one by one bigger convolution actual convolution. And then it it's followed by a feed forward layer, which again is kind of like a one by one convolution. So that's the idea behind this. Now, is it good or bad or, you know, independent of whether this should be called a transformer, because, you know, if I think of a transformer, uh, I, I do think of an attention mechanism, and the core of the attention mechanism is this information routing between elements of the sequence, right, just because you transpose it and call it attention, doesn't, I mean, it's kind of like an attention mechanism in that it contains a softmax, and it contains like keys and queries. Um, but yeah, then just because then you call it attention, and then that becomes a transformer. I'm not super sure. Uh, yeah, maybe, you know, 
are we now calling everything that has dynamic weights a transformer? I don't know. I guess we have to come to terms with the, the terminology right here of this. However, this appears to work quite well. So um, here they say, these are the contributions right here. So they include, include cross covariance attention, it includes a it provides a, a transposed alternative to conventional self attention, instead of channels instead of tokens, yada, 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 it tends to fix number of channels irrespective of the number of tokens, okay, they're more robust to changes in image resolution, which is also a good thing, right. Uh, so you can do variable size images. And they say, for image classification, we demonstrate that our models are on par with state of the art vision transformers from for using multiple model sizes, uh, they reach good accuracy on ImageNet. Um, they ha can do dense prediction tasks, and they can do self supervised learning uh, using something like Dino. And I've made a video about Dino. And if you so if you use the back the X side backbone with Dino, uh, it works apparently pretty, pretty well. So cool. Uh, this raises a number of questions, right? So it raises kind of more I'd say more theoretical question to explain what's going on in here, because there is an intrinsic connection between the two kinds of attention, right? They're not just random and look the same. But there's actually a discussion in the paper right here about the relationship between gram and covariance matrices right here. So you can transform one into the other other and uh, also the the eigenspectrums are related, not only related, but actually equivalent. So they say the non zero part of the eigenspectrum of the gram and covariance matrix are equivalent. And the eigenvectors can be computed in terms of each other. So there's an intrinsic connection between the two things, even though conceptually, they're very, very different. And I think to to go ahead and really kind of explain which one is good in which situations, why we do what and so on, is there even a difference? that is um, still to be seen. The second thing is that if this actually really works as they advertise, and you know, with recognitions of things like MLP mixer and so on, it seems like it's, it's not even important how you do it as long as you kind of shuffle information around a little bit. Um, and then you kind of do feed forward layers mixed with shuffling information around a little bit in some way. And this all appears to be kind of performing on par with each other. Now we have seen a trend to go away from we got a new state of the art to more like we perform on par with. Uh, so you never know how much you know how much trial and error and engineering went into this to actually make it perform on par with. And then lastly, um, yeah, this is interesting, because as you can see right here, uh, this model can handle, for example, different image resolutions, and it does scale uh, linearly with the image resolution. So the, the, the GPU memory consumption, you can see right here is even better than something like a ResNet 50, right? And that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty impressive. Though, on the engineering side, there are a number of things that apparently you have to do when you do these things. So one is like L2 normalizing correctly. And, and without that, it breaks down. Temperature scaling is another thing. Uh, so they have a learned temperature parameter right here, as you can see, uh, without which the performance degrades a little bit too. And there are there's another thing this block diagonal cross covariance tension. So not even they don't even attend from all channels to all channels So this matrix I've shown you before, they actually do this block diagonally. So only like the first two channels can attend to each other and the last two channels can attend to each other. They compared this to something like group normalization, that also has success only normalizing groups of channels together. So it seems like to me, this is my opinion, it seems like this is much more a, a level a better evolution on the uh, on convnets than it is anything much related to transformers. Um, 
so because also the same kind of things help right here uh, and yeah making it more local gives you better performance and so on uh, the fact that there's no info no long range information exchanged it really seems like an evolution on the on the convnet so I'm not really sure what to think of this other than that. I would love to see this kind of architecture on other tasks such as language because again, it being essentially a convnet also makes it really astute to working on images. Here you can see, by the way, the attention maps of the classification layer, which look super duper uh, clean, I guess. Um, so they say heads are sensitive uh, to similar pictures within the same or across images. Yeah, so I would be interested to see this in other tasks than than images um, to really see its, let's say its transformer like uh, properties. <laughs> Though I'm not, yeah, maybe we can start uh, a hashtag leave transformers alone or something. I don't know, we will have to all decide what a transformer really is. Um, in terms of performance, of course, uh, these models, they perform uh, fairly well, as you can see right here, though there are some trade offs you can see right here in in terms of um, in terms of number of parameters, if you compare them to models of the similar size parameters, uh, these large ones right here, they do often have more, um, more flops, uh, as you can, as you can see right here, uh, though you can also modify this, you can modify the resolution and they exist in smaller versions, which means larger patches. Sometimes the um, performance is better by a little bit. So here you can see it, it like it outperforms a little bit. I think um, it's a good thing that people say more like we perform on par with than touting the 0.1 uh, better performance as kind of state of the art in their sub classification. So you also see self supervised learning, it performs pretty, pretty decently. And down there, you can also see, I think, uh, they don't have pictures. So there's object detection, instance segmentation, and so on. They do ablation studies, where they figure out that, for example, um, removing this XCA layer drops their performance significantly. So this really seems to be the key ingredient to this, even though it, it's, it's kind of just quote unquote, a dynamic one by one convolution, but this seems to be the, the key ingredient to the, the workhorse. Also this local patch interaction, like the actual convolution, it drops the accuracy, but not by that much. Uh, but not by as much as removing the cross uh, the cross covariance attention layer. And you can see that without the L2 normalization, it just completely fails, which, you know, is interesting that. So, yeah, maybe as a lesson for future architectures, if you're looking to build a new architecture, and you see it just fails, uh, probably one out of uh, 200 current tricks that we know might make it converge and actually perform better than other models. So <laughs> who knows, who knows? Okay, so this model, it looks like, yeah, it looks like a, a good thing to try. My last criticism here is that they always use um, patches. So at the beginning, they tout Oh, what we do is we do, um, you know, we can, we can, we, we don't depend on the sequence length, this quadratic complexity, yada, 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 so on. Uh, you know, we say right here, high resolution images are prohibitive, yet they still use patches. And like, I get the idea behind using image patches. But it seems like if you are able to process the full resolution images, then the, the lowest patch size, why should it be eight by eight, I think here, I think the lowest patch size they have is eight by eight, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so this here, it means I think 24 layers, uh, patches of size eight, like, isn't it possible now that we have the fully 
like linear complexity in the number of tokens to actually go full resolution on these things. Though maybe, um, maybe they did and I just didn't see that in here. But it seems uh, this usage of patches themselves is a bit questionable if you have a model that is able to go to high resolutions. Or maybe they just want to put their parameters somewhere else entirely possible. Alright, so I invite you to check out this paper and check out the experimental results if you're interested in that. Uh, it's all fairly, fairly well documented. There is a long appendix that details even more things and more experimental results. There is pseudocode, PyTorch style, and yeah, there is uh, even some, some more queries and key visualizations. Okay, so I yeah invite you to check it out. Thanks for listening. If you like content like this, don't hesitate to share it out. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye.